Matt, Matt Nesto, the Editor-in-Chief at Payments.com. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. We are uh, taking a look at the changes in the global workforce, in particular, how you pay this dispersed group of increasingly international workers. A lot has changed since the pandemic, and we put together an esteemed panelist of experts to walk us through the changes, sort of how they're playing out, what are the pinch points, and where they're working. So I'll just introduce our guests first before we really get into it. Frederick Crosby, CRO at Neom. Thank you for coming on. Michael Brooks is the CEO of Golance. Uh, Dan Wesker, he's the COO at Deal. And Essen Balut, she is the co-founder at Remote, which is fun to say uh, with a little bit of challenge. But why don't, we, um, why don't we start with you, Frederick, and just maybe you can just set the stage in terms of how things have changed in 2022 after that crazy uptick in remote hiring and, and international hiring that we saw in 2020 and 2021. Yeah, right now it's full steam ahead. Uh, the huge momentum changes have happened as we came to a realization in the workforce that we didn't need everybody in the office. That's great for a lot of people domestically. They have a different lifestyle, but it also opened eyes to the managers in the world that I could find the best talent at the best price with the best skill set anywhere in the world. All these tools, such as what we're doing with this today, really have changed things. And the momentum of this shift is incredible. Uh, through the survey that we've done together, you saw that we, we had a change of people doing more international payments, uh, or sorry, international hiring, jump from 8% in 2020 to over 60% in 2021. And that number right. continues in 2022. There, there's so much interest in there. So it's it's been a great momentum change, and we see businesses just clamoring away for it for more. And, and you have a great panel here that's right in the middle of, of helping a lot of them <laughs> Yeah, let's talk, let's talk about the, that a little bit. Maybe we'll we'll, we'll go to uh, our other um, panelists and just have them kind of chime in. Maybe Michael, Dan, and then Essen. We'll, give us your thoughts in terms of what you're seeing. In, in particular, I think we can all probably agree that you know this is um, the continuation of a trend. I don't know if it's as hot, hot, cold, not quite, a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler uh, as we saw last year. But um, Michael, what, what are you seeing out there uh, that's uh, of note to you right now? So this, this trend I've been seeing go since uh, since I took my first company remote uh, in after the financial crisis of 2008, which was a which was a necessity um, because uh, it was the only way I could keep that company. It was a subscription billing platform, uh, an e-commerce platform, um, and the challenges that I had back then, a lot of them have been solved now. But it definitely 2020 went into hyperdrive where uh, you see everyone going, okay, I guess we got to go remote. <laughs> I guess this is what we got to do. I was yeah. like, yeah, I, I, I dealt with this already. Welcome, <laughs> you know, welcome to the club. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's people, the, I would say the greatest trend is that people adopted remote, the concept of remote work and especially companies that deal with sensitive issues like PCI compliance and whatnot, They've always believed they have to have a certain type of tight environment, but it, it they there there is a way to technically accomplish that um, remotely. So it's it, it was a immediate okay. We've got to do something. We can't have people come in, and then now it's a oh wait things are better. This is a better way of life. Wait a minute. Wait wait wait. This is what's available, and you know there's a great deal of anxiety. That people have when they're when they first let go of that yeah. corporate office culture. Um, so I would say the greatest uh, shift that I've seen over the last couple of years from 2020 to okay, we have to do this to 2022, where do we want to do this? Is the cultural shift, and mm. and we're seeing a lot more companies understand how to work with remote teams, uh, but from, but maintain that company culture that is making them attractive to hiring top talent and then also um, productive with, with their teams. Right. Dan, what do you think about that? What are you seeing out there? What is um, your uh, kind of observations right now for 2022 in particular, and maybe into 23? Um, well, we're not seeing any slowdown. That's for sure. We're seeing okay. more more of our customers um, hiring more people 
on a remote basis. I think what's really interesting is the type of benefits and the level of benefits that companies are providing or furnishing their team with. I think if we look back a couple of years ago and we look at some of the uh, Bay Area companies, they invested a lot of money into real estate. Um, they invested money and time and resource into stuff like come in early, have your breakfast on site. Maybe you can do yoga. Maybe you can use our amazing gym. Maybe if you stay late, you can um, attend a, a dinner. And this is all on the company. And you know, this to me is um, a, a real real estate based set of of benefits. And now, with the remote model, that poses a new um, a new problem or a new constraint. How do you deliver a really high standard of benefits to um, remote employees and remote workers? So we're seeing companies get really creative um, and coming to us with some pretty interesting requests you know can you can you do this can you send um can you send uh, our remote workers a um, remote office kit out can you send them uh, a desk a chair shelving can you um send them cocktail kits so we can do a remote happy hour uh, or can you send them some cooking course so we can do a remote wow. um, lasagna preparation on a Friday night? It's uh, becoming really interesting. I'm sure it gets absolutely absurd, just like the benefits did. And we all know them that were emanating out of Silicon Valley in, in the real peak days. Um, Matt, uh, Matt, can I jump into a quick point? Well, let, let, in, in one sec, let me just give Essen a, a, an, op, an opening sure, comment sorry. here. Uh, Essen, what, what, what do you think uh, uh, about what um, Dan just said and, and also just your observations? And I would just make a, a point of clarity because um, Frederick had mentioned the study that we did that showed 60% of companies reported hiring more international workers last year. So, you know, uh, that, that's kind of the baseline number that we're at least using at payments as, as sort of the, the growth metric as we move into 22. Essen, please, sorry to get... <laughs> Go yeah. On. Uh, well, I mean, back, back in 2017, when first uh, when we, when we uh, were about to launch uh, Remote, I mean, uh, we were you know um, uh, giving presentations and we we're saying, well, a hundred year workforce model is, is shifting, and you know um, there's a paradigm shift here, and rem remote workers are the main actors of this shift. You know, and p in, in companies will be we we'll want to, uh, you know, um, uh, we want to be more flexible and agile. And uh, well, I, I could see some eyes actually, like, you know, like not really, you know, uh, believing us uh, back then. I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the number and, you know, the numbers out there actually um, clearly show that, you know, companies who want to be, um, uh, you know, on top of the game need to adapt to this reality of, you know, um, the economy of, you know, today's uh, open and uh, remote, you know, uh, talent market. I mean, you know, um, companies uh, are no, companies are no longer, you know, stuck to, you know, like local talent pools, you know, like they can just go out there and, you know, they're like so yeah. free to choose, you know, uh, location independent, uh, you know, uh, professionals. And well, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, undeniably growing and, you know, nothing will ever stop that, you know, and like time and location flexibility is, is the reality of our day. Uh, back in, uh, I'm, I'm a geek. I love, you know, like research studies and, you know, like, um, and I, I'm not, like, I'm not going to hold myself, you know, from like giving a few numbers, but, uh, um, I was pretty impressed, actually, uh, by uh, the work trend index uh, dated 2021. Yeah, it must be after uh, COVID started, actually, uh, by by Microsoft that like over 40 percent of global employees um, uh, said, you know, like they were likely to leave their jobs in the next 12 months. This is 2021 uh, because not because like money issues, right. money related issues, but because, you know, uh, they wanted to be, you know, more flexible, you know, they sure. they. they more, you know, uh, like flexible hours, location, uh, personal wellness, mental health, you know, um, uh, they wanted better work life balance, you know, yeah, so, I knew you were going to I knew that that phrase was coming. I, I saw yeah, it. coming. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not a myth anymore, you know, so no, it's, it's, it's uh, a real what, thing. Exactly. So uh, really, I mean, times are changing. Very exciting times uh, are, are, are coming. And uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can't wait, you know, to see the developments. Well, I think Michael can't wait either because he wants to. He's been holding his thought here. What what what's out of your mind, Michael? I just thought it was interesting. Dan mentioned that uh, there were so many companies in San Francisco investing in real estate, um, and a, a fun fact I heard was that more billionaires were created during the tech boom in real estate in San Francisco than there was huh. in actual uh, technology to, technology companies, which was 
kind of a fun, fun, interesting fact. I don't mm. know if that's still true now, but it was. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what I was going to say. Rear view versus windshield uh, on that one. I, I mean, we, we, I talk to CFOs all the time about how you hold real estate on your balance sheet and justify it in, in a remote workforce to kind of bring us back to, to where we are. Frederick, you know, if you're, if you're talking to a company and they, and they want to, you know, dip their toe overseas, maybe for the first time, or they want to try a new region if they already are, you know, how, how do you, how does, how do you make that easier? What, what steps um, should be kind of thought about before, you know, doing so as it pertains, there's a million things, but as it pertains to, hiring and actually having either a remote footprint or a physical footprint as we're talked about, or, or some combination of the two hybrids pretty popular as well. Yeah. I mean, talking specifically of the global nature of things, this is a big shift. When you think about the numbers, we just said a lot of companies are dipping, tipping their toe in this for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of different realizations. I can speak to it coming from my company and we're a global payment platform and we got people all over the world. We're in 13 different countries, different pockets of expertise. I think one big thing you need to think about from an operation perspective is just, of course, the time zones and how everyone's gonna be able to interact. While we might be able to hire talent everywhere, you do have to make sure that the people that are going to be close to you don't have to stay up till midnight to do everything on that. But then on the other side, if it comes into the, the payment aspect of things, you bring people in, you make them fit, well, they're going to want to get paid. And there's a lot of different aspects of, of global payments that most companies never had to face, especially those people going in there for the first time. Um, payments have to be reliable. If, if you start working for a company and you're checking and coming in when you think it's going to come in, that's a problem. You know, check being the figurative term here, right? Because most people have also uh, adopted more modern forms of payment. Some people went in the bank. Some countries like to have it in an alternative payment method, like an e-wallet that's popular in their areas. Some people like to just store their, their money in, in various different types of, of digital formats. Of course, you got the crypto element out there too in some countries. These are new things you have to think about to make sure that you're able to please your workers at the end of the day by providing that as well. Um, well I yeah. Well, I, I was just going to uh, bring in, Dan is going to be our um, worker or pleasing, worker pleasing expert here today since he brought up all those things. But uh, I would ask you specifically, Dan, what, what um, are, the, are there certain friction areas for workers that you're hearing now? Like, you know, you had mentioned all the, the, the perks from the, from the good old days of a couple of years ago, but are, are there friction points now that, um, can be used as a competitive tool? I mean, I guess it's only limited by a company's ability to be creative and to come up with things and to hear problems and solve problems. Well, that's an interesting point. Um, we work with me and Frederick's uh, Frederick company to issue a card to our employees of record. Um, and this card can be used uh, to access the funds that have been earned and spend them at anywhere MasterCard and Visa are accepted. And what's most interesting here is the companies that are hiring these people refer to this as a benefit. Like, have you ever heard of a payment method you referred to as a benefit before? Probably not. Well, um, I have because I live in a very weird universe called payments. And so uh, <laughs> we're, we're here. We, we've actually reported on it you know, a lot about how especially for gig workers and short-term workers about same day pay and, you know, fast, fast payment is a huge perk right now. Increasingly so. It's more important than the amount. Ooh, the I don't know now. Is, wow. That's big, I, Michael. Rate. How, I, I, so I was at a marketplace risk conference, not, not too long ago, a couple years ago. And rate is not as important as speed of payment. You, you, you can get, better talent at a lower rate if you pay them quick. You're seeing a lot of... Uh, I love it. Yeah, I want to drill into those numbers a little bit, but go ahead, please. We're seeing a lot of our remote workers take the Visa card that I mentioned because of the, the speed. Visa is one of the fastest payment networks in the world. The other fast payment network is, of course, blockchain and crypto. We're seeing more and more remote workers um, choose to be paid in cryptocurrency and for a number of different reasons one of which is speed Still. another yeah another reason is as a hedge against um inflation which is another topical um topic 
right now. You know, we're seeing remote workers in Argentina and Turkey where they're seeing high double digit annual inflation and want to be paid in USD, stablecoin, Bitcoin, or other cryptos. Wow. That's it amazing. Is- I, again, I, the ideas are coming to my mind. Like the, the best hedge in my mind against inflation is higher wages. And we've seen wage inflation. But, you know, Michael's saying otherwise, Essen, do you see this right now? And I, I'm also equally surprised that given all the trillions that has evaporated from the cryptocurrency markets and the turmoil there, that anybody would want to, at a time of belt tightening globally, subject themselves to payday risk in terms of cryptocurrency. I'm fascinated by both of those statements, actually. Well, I mean, as, as Jamud, we actually stayed away from uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, for a long uh, while, uh, but it's uh, again, it's uh, uh, it will be inevitable, uh, you know, um, based on you know uh, the demand that we've been receiving. But uh, well, um, I mean, there's so many payment solutions out there, and uh, we work with uh, Neom as well, and um, it's it's just amazing to see, you know, like um, how fast uh, they're developing. I mean, for for us, for example, for for remote, um, uh, the the um, the coverage is. Um, I would say the coverage, everything. I mean, obviously, you know, the fees are important. And uh, like, uh, I mean, Michael said the speed, oh my God, you know, like super. I mean, we, we um, the remote workers, uh, it turns out remote workers are, you know, like uh, super impatient as well. So speed is like super important as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, coverage, I mean, like I, I believe there's still way, um, some, some, some way uh, for the payment uh, providers uh, uh, to, to, to uh, develop actually in terms of uh, coverage as well. Because I mean, we have, you know, uh, we have users from, you know, um, countries that, you know, I have a hard time, uh, you know, uh, uh, pronouncing their names, uh, but um, it, going back to crypto, um, it's. Uh, I mean, although we've you know stayed away from it uh, for <laughs> for a long time, we right. held ourselves. Um, it's it's it, it's coming. It's it's coming. It's inevitably coming as well. Yeah, true that. It's probably better time now than it was before. Uh, maybe I'd say maybe Frederick, Michael, maybe you guys can help me here. Um, is it? Has it gotten to a point where you can go to uh, a company, a, a client per se, and uh, show some sort of number in terms of like, you know, if you're able to do this fast payment thing, you will save X amount on top line uh, HR costs or, or salary costs for, for work. Has, has it gotten that? Is there a number? Is, is yeah. Are we there yet? So there there have been reports on that. Um, I I wish I had it in front of me, but I can tell you, we do we do things where we'll we'll charge for a fee paying out extra quick and say hey look you qualify for uh, getting rid of the review period so we 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 have a review and a security period um, where our clients can review it and we take that risk and we go hey here's a sizable fee um, we trust you enough to pay you quicker uh, but it's going to be a fee. And then if they elevate to another status level, we remove that fee and we just automatically pay them quicker. So it becomes a little bit of a status, but uh, um, I, I I don't have the exact data, but that's okay. To your point, I think yes, if, if I could just add on, I think you might be looking at it the wrong way. I don't think people are going in there thinking, okay, how much money am I going to save? They're going after talent and they want to make that talent happy. It's like, how satisfying can I make my employee base? So I don't have to go hire somebody else and go through all that churn. And all these mentions we just talked about between speed and variety and and, uh, at the end, the exchange rate and all that. Those are the great tools that now you have at your advantage. We're in the past. If you've got a thousand customer service agent, uh, it does matter. (laughs) Certainly it starts to add up. But I think you're also right when you're going for someone that can actually do the job and it's more of a skilled, I totally agree with you, Frederick. I think that it makes the most sense to say, hey, you're, because of uh, our status, we're going to be able to pay you very quickly and um, forego a lot of the, the restrictions and the, the concerns. I mean, uh, can I, can having, I just, ask a, every, just clarify one point here, uh, um, sure. Michael, is what is very quickly? Because if we say a bi-weekly pay cycle is the norm, I don't know if it yeah. is globally, but I'll just throw that out there. What what is very quickly? Like do we do we move yeah. wholesale so, right to the same day once so a week? We, weekly, 
uh, and then a review period and security period is standard. Uh, and then we tear down from there and we see people elated, right? So we first thing we do is we go, okay, we trust you enough, we get rid of the security time. And then we trust you enough, we're gonna get rid of the review time. Um, and then the next step is every day is payday. You work a day, you get paid that day. But something right. that like Uber does, right? right. You're, you're, you're driving for Uber, you pick somebody up, you drop them off, and then you get paid immediately after that ride. So, I mean, instant after, I, it might even be too much, too quick, but taking somebody of the highest caliber um, from a digital reputation standpoint sure. saying, I, I just believe this person, I want them to work for me. Um, I want them at our company. Uh, I, I'm just going to say, hey, look, as soon as you clock an hour, you're automatically getting paid for that hour. That's a next level. And that's where payments is going. And, and mm. that level of speed is highly attractive to some of the best talent in the world. Sure. And I'll also beyond that is payday advance, which is maybe the next, next level. We're seeing more yeah. and more of that right now, which is giving you a front of 500 bucks or whatever it is, um, you know, before you've even put the hours in. So uh, Dan, what yeah. do you think? How, how is this going to be used um, by companies to actually recruit people. Like, what do you think is going to work on the front line? So these luxurious, pampered, high demand tech workers who've been able to call their own shots, what is it going to take in terms of like payday movement to really like, what do they want to see? They want to see the, the next day. They want to see the advance. We, we have this on our platform. I think the key thing here, A, the product is contemplated as a benefit in the same day, way that the card was and the crypto payroll was. Second thing is, it is linked to remote working and kind of globalization. We've got employees and remote workers that are working for companies that are based in countries that offer this type of solution. You can walk down the street in America and you can find somebody to give you an advance it's probably not going to be at a competitive rate or a, or a economical rate, but you will find someone to do it. What's interesting is when you have somebody working for an American company located in a country where you can't do that, or you can do that, and but the economics are even worse, that's where it becomes really powerful. You know, you give that to somebody in country X and they're able to get that ad advance, but they're not going to have to give their car as collateral. Um, that's what's really powerful. And that's mm. why it can be a great international global benefit. One of the things, you know, you're bringing me back to international. One of the challenges of doing business internationally, let alone just hiring people to do that business, is the jurisdiction by jurisdiction changes in, in taxation and regulation. That's a huge problem. And Frederick's nodding. So why don't you talk to me about that in terms of how that plays out into the broader conversation that, that we're having, tax and regulation in particular, because those are really problem areas, all our studies have indicated. Yeah, look, sure. I'm oh, sorry, is that to, to me or Dan? Uh, well, uh, it's to both, but I was I, I thought to you, Fred, Frederick. You got it, Fred, you got it. Sure, sure, well, actually, I'm gonna defer back to this panel right here. That's why you go for some of these companies around there, because it it's hard. I mean, one thing that Essen talked about which is really one of the hardest things about thinking globally about getting your talent is how different each country is. People making this jump from a domestic mindset to a global mindset, they think, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to send some kind of currency, but every country's got its different tax rules, different countries have different regulations on just how you can send and how much you can send. It can get complex if you go it alone. And that's why the birth of some of these great companies has really come to be. So Dan, I'm going to toss it back over to you because you're right there trying to solve this problem for people. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think taxation in general is well understood. I think when we speak about cross-border employment and cross-border work engagement, it's not well understood. And the guidance and the systems and the processes that local authority and local government give don't cater for this case. And that's why there's such 
big problems to solve. And that's why we've got you know, several great, great companies on this panel today, um, because it's a real problem. Working for a US company, that's a whole different type of um, taxation and requirement that is required to be fulfilled. And it's really not simple. So I think as this becomes, and as this industry moves on and remote working becomes more quote unquote normal, countries will catch up and will provide better tools, processes for people to calculate taxes, pay taxes and whatnot. But ultimately it's in the country's interest. The company, the country's collecting its, its revenue um, to run its infrastructure and run its kingdom without collecting taxes in the most efficient way, it's potentially mm. missing out. I'm going to have to put more effort into going after people and finding them and whatnot. So I, I think as this evolves, um, the, the tools and the processes will get better. Okay. Yes, I just want to give you a, an opportunity to jump in here before we change topics. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, tax related, you know, um, uh, questions have been one of the most frequently asked questions, actually, since uh, since uh, the beginning of remote. And um, well, unfortunately, you know, uh, most of the countries, uh, even even the most developed ones, actually, uh, the regulations um, uh, lag behind when it comes to you know um, uh, taxation of you know uh, international hiring and uh, flexible workforce, which we're you know uh, focused on, and um, it's 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 a very challenging issue uh, for us as well. Um, and uh, well, I mean, region or uh, country specific uh, regulations obviously need to be addressed uh, individually, like like uh, Frederick said, you know, like all all the countries have different regulations it's it's mind-blowing um, um also um it, you know uh, companies actually it's, it's, so, it's also important to um uh, point out that uh, you know um some some uh, companies integrate you know like diverse work models into the company as well you know they they uh they they have you know a part of their workforce on on you know, a payroll, you know, part for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, part of, part of the workforce works as, you know, a contractor, you know, uh, and um, so um, all these need, you know, like different approaches, you know, when, it, when in terms of, you know, like filing taxes and compliance. So uh, it's really, I, I believe it's really important to, to work with, you know, uh, reliable, uh, trustworthy, you know, um, uh, external partners, you know, uh, you, you, I mean, we've, we've uh, experienced this, this uh, challenge uh, ourselves as well. So so it's really important to, you know, uh, understand your needs and find um, um, uh, those uh, reliable uh, partners. Cool. What, now, one thing, uh, if we're all agreeing that this is just a, 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 a barge moving along, unstoppable, big macro force in, in a changing world, um, I wanted to kind of drill down a little bit on like who... You know, it, who, how do you know if the shoe fits, so to speak? How, how do you know if this is right for you? I would say our, our the research report that we did um, with Niam, uh, I think it was with Niam, uh, one of our reports showed that something like 80% of firms that did more than a billion in revenue um, added annual or added international workers last year. So big, right? Is this is this a big players market only or... You know, we would talk, Michael, you talked about a thousand gate agents or service agents, and then, you know, that's not for everybody. So who, who to who does the, the shoot fit for this sort of payment and recruitment process? Yeah, so, I mean, the, to your point, like when you go to countries like India, and we run into this all the time, which is one of the biggest business processes outsourced, the big enterprises definitely are the 800 pound gorilla there. If you're, they know who the, the best talent is and they have uh, invested heavily on boots on the ground recruitment. However, there's ways around that. And there's, uh, there, there's always wiggle room. And if you look at countries like Bangladesh, and this kind of goes a little bit to the last conversation. And I tried to work with the government of Panama to set up a structure like it, but it was a little bit challenging. Um, Bangladesh takes companies like ours and some of our competitors and any money that flows into their country, they give their freelancers 4% back. So they like to see the capital flow in. Uh, countries like the Philippines have set up entire training system. And I think you've got like 3 million uh, freelancers in the Philippines working in online, online platforms. So um, 
there there's there's an abundance of talent it's it's anybody's game uh, it, it's really how set up is your company to acquire this type of remote talent and manage and maintain a remote work culture. Um, that's that's what I see. So yeah, the big guys they've got a leg up. They've got a leg up with everything. They always have a leg up. Yeah, but, more money. Uh, than the SMBs can get in there and they can find their little angles and they can scoop up some really <laughs> high quality talented people um, or they can just scoop up the people that they need that to run their business, like customer service agent. They don't need to be, you know, rock. They don't need to be high level coders, but they still need to have a, a, an element of, uh, of capability. Um, I, I would say that the companies that we find the SMBs, typically the midsize companies, not, not really the, the two or three freelancers that are trying to hire, but the, the midsize companies, they set up their own training. And they spend a lot of time and invest a lot of time training right. their people. So they'll take good people. They test, 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 test all time, not just skills, cognitive testing, creative testing. You'd be surprised. You can ask for all different types of testing. And I mean, the whole Myers-Briggs testing, everything right. and put people through a system in a funnel. And um, that's how I see the SMBs really competing with the enterprises. So it's still anybody's game. Well, cool. uh, I just want to, you know, I don't want to get too, too long in the tooth here today, but maybe um, Dan, S and Frederick, you can kind of add on to that as we sort of um, give you each a, you know, your kind of closing thoughts in terms of where this is headed, who it works for and, and how it, and how it's going to play out, Dan. I think it works for everyone. <laughs> That's the vision. Right? I'm so little bot. I love that analogy. I think regulation will catch up. We've alluded to that a little bit, not only when it comes to taxation, but when it comes to labor regulation as well. Employment today is really only happening domestically and cross-border employment is marrying two domestic systems together. Will there be an international infrastructure that allows for cross-border employment in the domestic sense, but between two countries, that's going to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the, the surrounding or ancillary adjacent things such as benefits, payments, um, equipment, delivery, real estate, how this all evolves is also going to be really interesting. I imagine the global law firms are salivating at the thought of merging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, Essen, your, your kind of uh, crystal ball view of, of, <laughs> of where this uh, global hiring and payment uh, trend is headed? I mean, it's uh, like I said, it's it's very exciting times. I mean, uh, especially for you know, like uh, work uh, for for companies like you know, a deal and uh, remote uh, remote. Um, well, um, in, I mean, hiring internationally, uh, you know, paves the way for uh, for companies to reach the spot on, you know, uh, independent talents, like wherever they are, you know, so no more, you know, barriers left, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, for businesses and uh, for, for people as well. I mean, come on, like, great resignation, you know, like, I mean, it's, 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 um, we, a lot of people didn't see it coming, probably, you know, uh, but people like, I mean, it's, you know, it, 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 it was inevitable for us, you know, and um, well, uh, they uh, both, you know, uh, businesses and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, employees, you know, uh, have been actually looking for, um, you know, alternative, you know, uh, work uh, arrangements. So, um, you know, the, 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 the paradigm shift was, you know, like was, was coming. So um, I, I don't know, you know, like, you know, company, companies like us are like super, super excited uh, to be able to, you know, uh, pave new grounds for, you know, uh, both organizations and, uh, and, and, and talents as, you know, uh, those work uh, arrangements uh, are changing and uh, we're um, super, uh, also super excited to have you know like partners uh, like Neum and you know uh, other other partners that uh, support us to support 
those organizations and independent talents to to um, you know uh, work work together and you know um, um, uh, like securely and in compliance. So, I mean, we talked about tax a lot. Right. You know, compliance is another issue. You know, for for uh, for companies who want to work with you know international talents. So. Uh, um, you know, very excited, exciting. You know, days are there's days are coming, and we're so excited to you know part of this uh, transformation. Yeah, well, Fred, to give the unenviable task of trying to braid it all together in a twenty second summation. <laughs> Hopefully, you were thought, you know had a, had a go at law school at one point in your life. But I could really say my team in twenty seconds. But let me go with the who and the what. I just want to echo what Michael said. This is across all levels of companies. I mean, our company, or a thousand people all over the world. We started with two guys on different ends of the world. The two co-founders came from Singapore and London. That's just the nature of how things are done. In Silicon Valley, you see this all the time. Yeah. I've worked with a lot of SMBs or small five-person organizations that have people all over the world. This is just across the board the way things work nowadays. Now on the what, we've talked a lot about a lot of different great things about what's going on with payments, about the variety of ways you get funds in your bank uh, or in cash or on card and crypto. This ecosystem is growing because not only can you get your money in different ways, the variety of services that are going there, including early payment, but other investments, things that you can put the money into right away is going to create businesses that are allowing and give benefits through different means of managing that money directly to this remote workforce. The, the uh, wonderful things are going to come from the merge, this stew of financial services all being digitally interconnected is uh, leading to a fantastic future. How can we do better than that? A fantastic future. We love the future here and it looks fantastic uh, despite the current headwinds that we're all scratching our head about. So thank you so much, uh, Frederick Crosby for, from NEOM. Thank you, Michael Brooks from Golan. It's great to have you on. Uh, Essen Balut from Remote. Love to say that. I couldn't say it enough. And Dan Westgarth from Deal. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Look forward to getting together again and uh, doing an update, seeing whose forecasts are the most accurate. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Matt. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.